And you have to take the time for you to understand it, not to rush to complete something. That's never the point in watchmaking to end the production, because then what are you gonna do? Welcome back. In this part of me documenting my visit to the KHWCC watchmaking school in Switzerland, we see the room where the full-time students learn. It's really eye-opening. I hope you enjoy. I really, um, I really loved being there. Henrik has such a great a practical approach to teaching and watchmaking. The way is that you have a bar with a watch part here and then you're beveling like that. Yes. And you just use this as a support. And then if my students do that, that depends if they like to have it or if they like this uh, kind of uh, way of working. Okay. It's not every student who will do it. Yeah. It's quite, even though that I have a, the same curriculum for everybody or same program for everybody to follow, it's a base program, but it's not that each and every student are doing exactly the same. They also have, um, when they make the tools, they have certain uh, uh, freedom to design them how they want. Some tools have to be exactly like the drawing, but many of the tools they can design with whatever design they want, as long as they have uh, the same function. Yeah. And the same goes for the school watch. Some wants to do the whole school watch, of course. You might not finish it because it's a lot of work to do an entire school watch in two years. Uh, and some want to do base it on a ETA or a vintage water or something that's probably more doable and some don't want to do it at all. They want to restore something or do several restoration projects. It's very individual. I think it's important for a student to kind of try to find out what they want to do yeah. as a special uh, part of the course or extracurricular work. Mm. That's really good. And then I guess it'll keep the student more engaged in what they're yeah, yeah it could be something they don't really want to do. Exactly. I mean, I have the minimum, which yes. I try to keep to a minimum that I have benefited very much for myself. And it could be kind of boring for some students. It's hand filing, just filing with a metal tool shaping. <laughs> yeah, but not every student like that. <laughs> yeah. But everybody must do yeah, that. Yeah. And I don't want to let go of a student here who didn't learn filing. I would be embarrassed then. Mm. So there are certain specific things that I think every watchmaker should learn uh, to, to feel complete, also for them to feel complete once they leave the school. Maybe it's nice now they don't learn it and they, oh, it's you know cool to, to work with the flashy brands and industrial watches. But then what happened 10 years down the line when you want more out of your uh, watchmaking life or career? Mm. And I don't want to take that, those classical bits and pieces out because I benefited tremendously from it. And those I, I keep obviously in the program, and uh, but maintaining also quite a lot of freedom. And they have full access to the school if they want, uh, even the weekends and after hours if they want to. And so they, they have a. And what else are you gonna do in La Locle? Is my question. <laughs> it might not be that much else to do. So I noticed that um, students here are kind of staggered in their starting time of the courses. So the teaching method is it sort of, uh, I guess if you break it down, I'm not sure how you run it. If it's sort of modules, you go through them and then you let them go at their own sort of um, fruition to to master that module. And then there's teachers there available for if they need help with something. Is that? Yeah. So right now I have two students who started in the same time, my full skill class. And they are uh, following exactly the same, more or less. And then one student came later. Um, so they would be at different parts, but in the same program. For me, it doesn't actually matter at all. I can have five programs running at different time. It doesn't make it different. I just take out this uh, teaching module to teach the guy that part. And then I teach him that part when the time arrives. So it doesn't, I have never noticed any difference whatsoever. Uh, when the student starts and ends the course. It, it, uh, that would, I guess it would be to, for schools with uh, more than five students who have to control, I don't know, 12, 20 or 30 students. Then it would be more convenient if everybody start the same, the teacher teach only the same and then they go home the same time. Otherwise, how can you, it would be impossible for the teacher. Mm -hmm. But if you have four to six students, it makes no difference when they're starting makes no difference for me at all. And I can have one class a demonstration how to 
uh, file the square of a winding stem, and uh, the next day I show how to make a hairspring flat. That would just be up to the teacher to have the full range of skills to be able to teach everything at any given time. Mm -hmm. And I have never uh, felt uh, any problem with that at all. Plus, it I feel it uh, keeps me sharp to always know everything what I'm supposed to teach. No matter, it shouldn't matter when I do it. I should already be prepared mm -hmm. and I should just be ready to go and teach. And that's how, how I do it. And it, to be honest, it's just more interesting for me. Uh, and if you look at the board, what I'm teaching, on one I'm teaching drawing, and then on the second lower picture, I'm actually teaching somebody to do hairsprings. It's totally different uh, subjects. So if everybody have just different program. It's also the other good thing I find is that there is very little or I don't think there is any pressure of competition, which I think could uh, uh, be not the best for every student. Mm -hmm. If they're all starting at the same time, yeah. they're competing and that might lead to worse and worse quality because now they're rushing through the program. But if they're working with different things, they don't feel like they're rushed. They can really concentrate on learning what they're supposed to be learning rather than rush through competition. Competition is good, but it doesn't work in watchmaking at all. Mm -hmm. it's, it's more of an art. And you have to take the time for you to understand it, not to rush to complete something. That's never the point in watchmaking to end the production, because then what are you going to do? Yeah. It's, for me, it's a journey to reach there and then restart it again. And it's the journey always mm -hmm. with watchmaking. With maybe other things, it's the point that is the point. The, the point with watchmaking is just the travel, when you're finished with the watch, the project or whatever, that's the worry time. Because what are you going to do now? That's how I think. It's mm. very good. Um, and here we have another so. proper projector, just more expensive and more modern. But And now we have the, the digital readout. But it's nothing really um, special, except maybe now you, it can help you to work. Because you can also hear like the jig borer, you can measure things. But it, it just looks more advanced than it is. It's exactly the same. I put something here, you will see my finger. That could be a watch part. But with this cross here, I could then just measure parts, move, moving them back and forward. Kind of like a CMM. So you could uh, measure the, the drill hole distances? Yes, yes, for example, very common use. You see like this. And then you would get the, the movement displayed in millimeters over here. And it goes down to 1000 of a millimeter. So it's convenient to use this together with the jig boring. It's more like a, a backup. And at the same time, you can also... That you cannot do with the old one. But with this one, you can turn the table and measure angles. Uh, yes. So it's very compatible uh, with... Um, with a jig boring machine. But it's also a bit of a luxury. It's not, not really anything you, that you would need. It's a bit overkill. But mm -hmm. once you have it, it's really, really it's good. Really, yeah. Very handy to work with. Uh, then we have two complete 70s for communal use. Here Harman is working with uh, removing balance staffs. He's in the technician course, so it's only eight months for him. But yet he learns how to replace balance staffs, which becomes even uh, uh, something that they, they don't might not do in um, uh, uh, watchmaking schools. I think they're discussing to remove balance staff replacements. Mm -hmm. But that's very important. And uh, yeah, two of the same. And then we have an overhead microscope as well. So that uh, in the um, uh, watchmaking one-week classes, they may, might actually use the microscope sometimes so that they can clearly see what happens when they are actually uh, cutting. That's a good uh, teacher as well, a microscope, because you see reality what happens. Yeah. Uh, a normal bench drilling machine for regular work. Now a student is setting up something there. He's going to drill the holes of a, one of his tools. And this is my office. It's an open work setup. I don't have a real office, to be honest. That's it. This is where I work. 
My administrator Svenja has the office and she needs it way more than me. She's also way more important than me to <laughs> put everything together and make everything work very fluently. So I'm very happy to have her. And yeah, other than that, I'm always sitting here n next to my student. And whenever they have questions, they can ask me. We have it. It's very open. Mm -hmm. And everybody are working on their own thing. Yeah, that's very cool. And yeah, Pierre, he's going to start. Uh, yeah, he already started his school watch. Also, when they started, it's very individual. Some started at the very end of their education. And Pierre, he wanted to start it as soon as he possibly can. And he just started it even before he finished the basic filing and so on. Okay. And it doesn't really matter because you will sooner or later learn everything anyway. And mm -hmm. at what order you learn it, it's not really that important. But it's maybe recommended to sometimes learn micromechanics before certain things. like Or you want to learn making larger tools before the smaller watch parts. But you can also learn to make the small watch parts immediately first and then learn the bigger tools later. It really doesn't make that big difference, I have noticed. It's just maybe slightly easier with the larger tools because you can observe what happens. Yeah. And that's why he started with the uh, school watch parts. And now once in a while he goes back to review. Here is one of the parts that each and every student have to do. This is a good example also. Uh, I call it a rectangular press fit plate. It's to learn dueling, actually. It's the first uh, thing that they machine, or one of the fir earlier things, and it's just a rectangular brass block with three holes. Then they have to turn uh, three um, small cylinders, where one ha is uh, conical, like with a male cone, and one is a female cone. The female cone what they are learning there is to spot the centers of wheels which have broken pivots. So they are pr practicing that already after a few weeks, how to with a graver by hand spot the center of the turning part so that they can later re-pivot a wheel. Of course, they don't know that, but it's part of their... Many, all, every single tool is made like that. They are, each tool is representing something that they will need to use as a restorer later on in their career and that's one and then they also learn on this the general turning how to set up the lathe and everything the, with the gravers etc but also how to press them in because these parts have to be pressed with friction into the brass that means now they learn jeweling how to swap the jewels in a watch plate or bridges so that's a good example of tools yeah, and so each yeah. and every tool is made like that and uh so it's more than one just, uh, yeah, you, you kind of, <clears throat> you, they also get a tool and they're also learning watchmaking as you... As From it. They might not, they might think, oh, it's just this boring tool again, and yeah. they might not think about the purpose. But every single tool has a very important purpose, which they will experience in the second year. If they skip this, then they will lack certain skills that would be practical to have in the second year mm -hmm. or later in their career. So it's not that they just do mindless tools or anything. Every yeah. tool has to be justified because we have only the two year. And this is something I fine tune uh, with each batch to try to optimize and make it better. But honestly, I haven't, I didn't need to change much with the program in the 10 year because I'm very satisfied with what the, what the students are accomplishing and their skills and the jobs that they get and so on. So it's very little that I have changed. These tools are still here 10 years after uh -huh. yeah. because you still need the same skill it's not that it changes very much mm -hmm. you can maybe add something if somebody wants they, they might want to learn more high technology like uh, the inventor or or the fusion 360 but that's just something that they can add to the course on their own free time but this is it doesn't really change it's the same i'm not sure that other classical arts such as playing the violin you know, I'm not sure that is changing dramatically from year to year. It, they are probably still doing it in very similar ways like 100 years ago and other uh, similar crafts uh, uh, or arts or how you make handmade knives and, yeah. okay, maybe you have a, a stronger and automatic press now. Uh, like I have now a guided pantograph that cuts out my spare parts. 
that's about it. It's not that much uh, more technology. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe in the future, hopefully, we would also get um, better priced or not so expensive electro erosion machines, tabletop versions, where we could print out parts in restoration, for example. But we are not there yet. You still have to pay uh, very much for them. Yeah. And yeah, other than that, nothing really special here. Is that what happens when you start? You go to get a learner and you progress? Oh, oh. <laughs> actually, no, we use this to uh, swap for uh, parts. <laughs> if, we, if we lose parts, then we can fish them up. Because oh, they usually start, you come a learner and then when yeah. you graduate, you, you have to have it's it. It's on the back yeah. of your yeah. start. Yeah. You have it in uh, Australia also? Yeah. For yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, because not every country have this symbol. But yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ours some have some yellow. Our one's yellow and black. And black L. Black L. Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> and then, of course, I have the uh, overhead screen connected to my uh, microscope so that they can see yep. very close up what I'm doing. And then I can show them live the whole class, or just if I want to, I can also be here and away from the rest of the student and discuss in person. If a student would feel intimidated or something and you don't want to show it to the whole class. Yeah. And this is for just for everybody to use. Then everybody can see, for example, this coin here. Like that. And we can zoom in to 86 times mm -hmm. if you want to see very close up. This is a Swiss, Swiss 10 cent coin. Yeah, it's a bit scary that close up. Yeah. So <laughs> if you've made it. <laughs> yeah, it might look a bit rougher <laughs> yeah. when you look in, in this one. And yeah, uh, then I use uh, actually Vostep models for teaching as well. Harman is now learning the hair spring, so then I'm telling him how it's supposed to be with this model. And then I can simulate, oh, here we have a hair spring problem that doesn't look proper. And they conveniently put the correct line. Mm -hmm. So the student can then just very easily put it back according to the line. And then they would learn at which point um, to bend the hairspring before they start with the small watch hairsprings. Very convenient uh, so, tool to teach off with. Yeah, Harmon, you mentioned he's doing the technician yeah. uh, <clears throat> course, and so you teach uh, hairspring in... The... Yeah, I don't teach in the technician course the full vibrating that they would need for restoration. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't learn how to repair any antique watches. But to some degree, they will still learn uh, vintage watches. So Harman, he's also learning how to exchange if there is a balance stuff broken. And because of that, he also have to learn something about hairspring, how to throw them flat and centered around the collet and how to pin, uh, pin them up properly to, to the stud and make them flat and centered under and then to do the timing. And that's probably a bit further uh, than most technician courses would offer. It would be more mo mostly uh, assembly and disassembly. He also learned the full um, full service of the Swiss lever escapement, where you have to take out the jewels, adjust the staff, uh, understand uh, divisions and end shakes, uh, the, the total locks, uh, and so on. So, yeah, the, the full theory of, of a watchmaker, actually, plus actually all the rest. That's the same as a watchmaker. And hairspring is the only thing. Difference is that they only do adjustments with hairspring, changing balance stuff and so on, but they don't have to do the vibrating for an antique watch. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same. I hope you guys enjoyed that part of the series. St uh, part four is coming out very soon. Stay tuned and uh, look forward to seeing you again.